The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. My name is Julie Rupert. I'm the marketing manager for the high school science line here at Savvis Learning Company. And we are so happy to have you join us today for our exciting webinar, Why Can't We Walk Through Walls, with Dr. Christopher Moore. Dr. Moore is the Dr. George F. Haddock's Community Chair in Physical Science at the University of Nebraska Omaha, where he directs programs for pre and in service secondary chemistry and physics teachers. Chris has degrees in chemistry and physics, has worked as a physical science teacher at several secondary schools in Virginia, and runs both a materials science research lab and a lab on chemistry and physics education. He is author of the books, Teaching Science Thinking, Using Scientific Reasoning in the Classroom, and Creating Scientists, Teaching and Assessing Science Practice for the NGSS. He is co-author of the curriculums, Experience Chemistry and Experience Physics. Now, before we get started, I have a couple of housekeeping items. All of your lines are muted. If you have questions, please put them in the question box, which is on the right side of your screen. I will try to answer those that I have about logistics throughout the session, but if you have any questions for Chris, I will read them out loud for you at the end, so feel free to ask at any time. We will post a recording of this webinar on savvis.com slash science dash webinars. I'll post the link in the chat box on the side of your screen in case you didn't write it down. You can also sign up for future webinars or browse our videos on demand category from that link. Now, with all of that out of the way, I will turn it over to Chris. Thank you, Julie. Uh, today we have a very interesting question to answer. And that question is why we can't walk through walls. So the photo that we're looking at here is actually of a bison. Uh, that is a sculpture of a bison. It's obviously not a real bison that's going through the uh, building that is right around the corner from me here in Omaha, Nebraska. Now, we, of course, can't walk through walls like this uh, sculpture can. And the reason why is actually quite interesting. It goes a little bit deeper than some of us might think. And uh, the answer has to do with both the electric force and some really interesting quantum physics. So the subtitle of this talk is also building a mental model for contact forces, right? Because what we're really going to be talking about to answer that kind of deep and big question is what exactly is a contact force? When I touch the table or I touch the wall or I touch the floor, uh, what's actually touching? And what's actually happening at the interface between me and those objects are you know, a block and a table. Right? So we're going to go and build a mental model for those contact forces and think about what makes up the objects and how they're going to interact on a microscopic scale. And then how that interaction will make itself uh, seen on the macroscopic scale of us bumping into walls. So before we get too far in, just uh, Julie's already introduced me, but I'll do a short little introduction again. I'm Chris Moore. I'm one of the co-authors of the curricula Experience Physics and Experience Chemistry, and I'm also the author of the books Creating Scientists and Teaching Science Thinking. Those two books are available to be ordered where books are sold. Uh, specifically, you can find them at creatingscientists.com, which is my website. I'm also on Twitter, uh, I'm on Facebook, and I'm on YouTube at Chris Moore Sci. So feel free to find me on Twitter and uh, send me a tweet. So let's look at this idea of contact forces and non-contact forces. Here we have an orangutan hanging from a rope, and that orangutan is experiencing a large number of different types of forces. So the very first one to think about might be the gravitational force, right? What keeps the orangutan, uh, what would happen if the orangutan let go, let go? It would fall to the ground. And that has to do with the gravitational force uh, that's trying to pull the orangutan down to the earth. So there's a force that is a non-contact force between the earth and the orangutan. Non-contact meaning they're not touching. There's no contact at all, right? But then the contact forces that are involved here. So I have my orangutan holding on tightly to the rope. So the, their hand and the rope are touching. And so that creates these force pairs. 
Um, it's an interaction between a rope and a hand, and that manifests itself as a force by the rope on the orangutan and a force by the orangutan on the rope. But that rope is also going to stretch, and it's going to be pulled and uh, pulled down, pull, you know, pulls up on, in the sense we can think of it, pulling up on the orangutan. But what's actually going on in that rope? Well, if we think about it, it's rope's composed of a bunch of atoms, and those atoms are attached to each other by bonds. And, and we can start to think about those bonds as uh, being like little springs. We're gonna go into that in a little bit more depth here in just a second, that spring model that you're seeing right there in the corner, right? But if we go even deeper, right? And if we look at the atom itself, right? We have protons and we have neutrons, and then we have electrons. And the electrons are whizzing around the, uh, the, the, the nucleus of the atom, and they're held there by the electric force. That electric force causes an attraction between the protons and the electrons. And if we go even deeper, if we look at all the protons and the neutrons, they're shoved together and the electric force should be blowing them apart. But they don't because of another force on a very different scale, a much smaller scale, uh, called the weak and the strong force. These are the nuclear forces that keep the nucleus from flying apart. So that's kind of all of our different forces that we think about day to day. Now, what we're gonna find is that in reality, all of those cool contact forces, like normal and friction that you might have heard of, or tension, those are all really just at a very small level, uh, just non-contact forces dressed up uh, in a different way. So I told you to think about springs. I said, look at uh, this picture of the rope where we zoomed in and we saw little atoms attached to little bitty springs. Well, let's think about how a spring behaves. Right. So you might have heard about Hooke's Law. In our, our curriculum, we go into a little bit of depth on that um, and, you know, to, to get us to this point. So we're assuming some knowledge here. But if you think about Hooke's Law, that's going to describe the relationship between the force exerted by a spring on a hand and the distance that that string, spring is stretched or compressed. So if we start off at what we call equilibrium, right, that's where I'm applying no force and the spring has a certain length. If I take my hand and I push in, so in the picture that you're looking at, if I push towards the left, right, then that spring is going to push back at me, uh, causing a force that's pointing towards the right on my hand. I want you to look at the subscripts that we're using here. So the subscripts here at the very tippity top here, the force HS. That stands for the force by the hand on the spring. And then this one would stand for the force by the spring on the hand. This is a third law pair between the spring and the hand interaction, right? So the spring is applying a force on the hand that's pointing towards the right. We're going to call that, uh, we're going to go ahead and call that positive, right? And then the uh, hand is applying a force on the spring that's pointing to the left. We'll call that negative. So you can see why down here the force would be positive because we're looking at the force that the spring applies on the hand. Now at this level right here, our little uh, uh, object is at equilibrium. There's no net force whatsoever. It's not uh, being stretched or compressed. And then as we start to pull it out, you can see the directions of these arrows change, right? So the force by the spring on the hand is pulling the hand, trying to pull the hand back and the force by the hand on the spring uh, is try, is pulling on the spring forward. And so we get a negative pointing force for the force by the spring, all right? And if we connect all of these dots, we get something that you know looks like a line. We get a, a, a nice straight line and we call that, uh, the, that relationship uh, Hooke's Law. It's a proportional relationship between the amount of stretch of a spring and how much we've, uh, you know, and the force that we have to apply to get that amount of stretch. And there is a uh, proportional constant that we call the spring constant, gives us a, a information about the springiness of the spring, and we can get that constant by uh, fitting all of this wonderful data to a straight line and then finding the slope. So why all this discussion about springs? Why are we talking about springs? The question was why can't we walk through walls? Well, we're getting there. But first we have to build a mental model for the solids that keep us from walking through walls. And it turns out that thinking about 
solids as it's like little spring systems actually works very well on a microscopic level. So let's think about the concept of tension. So a kitty cat climbs up a rope, right? The uh, cat, maybe it's holding on tight to the rope. We know the cat has some weight. That weight's pointing down. And if the cat's not moving, if it's not accelerating, then there has to be some force pulling up on the cat. Well, there's uh, the cat's paws holding on. That's a contact force. And then there's also uh, the tension, what we call the tension inside of the rope. We often model that upwards force on the cat as a tension. Well, what's actually, what is the tension? Well, the tension is just the force along the length of the rope. Microscopically, it's just the result of these spring-like forces on the atoms due to the chemical bonds. So you can imagine the rope being made up of lots of little atoms, and all of those little atoms are connected by little springs. And the chemical bonds, you know, this is again just a model. They're not actual little springs here, but those bonds are behaving similar to little springs. And we can stretch and we can compress. And it gets a little bit more complicated than that on a larger macroscopic scale. But on a, a very fine microscopic model, we can actually think about this as little balls connected by little springs. And that explains some stretching. Uh, it also can explain some compressing. But what exactly is this little spring that's in between all of the atoms within the solids that we interact with? Well, it's made up of two parts. Again, first, there's no actual spring, but the first one is what we call an attractive electric force. So we'll get to that. We'll explain that here in a second. But let's just, we just know that there's gonna be some attractive force. If I pull them far enough apart, they're gonna to wanna to be pulled back together. Right? So the atoms, if I try to pull them apart, they don't like that. They want to be pulled back together. But then there's got to be this repulsive component where if I push the atoms together, they want to be pushed back apart. Right? So the chemical bonds themselves have both attractive and repulsive components depending on the distance. And something else we've seen that has both attractive and repulsive components, depending on how much it spins, you know, the distance between things or the compression, is a spring. And so that's why we can model these bonds as little springs, right? And we're gonna see what those, where those forces come from here in a second, but right now it's really interesting to just think of these things as springs. And when we think of solids like this, little balls connected by little springs, what we are creating in our mind is what's called an Einstein model of a solid. So it's gotta be pretty good because it's got Einstein's name on it, right? interesting model that we can use to think about the interactions that are happening between two surfaces. So this brings us to our surface force, that contact force between two objects such as a block sitting on a table. We know that there's an interaction between the, uh, the two objects touching and that they experience a perpendicular surface force. And that surface force is caused by these spring-like interactions, as we can see if we zoom in. So if we start off looking at the box, we have uh, a force on the box by the table. Uh, I'm sorry, we have a force by the box on the table. That points down. That would be the force on the table. And then we have a force by the table on the box, and that's pointing up. Right now it's labeled as N, but uh, really it should be the force by the table on the box. That's pointing up. Right? And if we zoom in, what we can see is uh, those two surfaces may look smooth, but they start to look rougher as we get closer and closer until we vi finally zoom into the atomic scale. And then we see these things, or at least we're modeling these uh, surfaces as little balls and little springs attached to each other. And how might we go about modeling a surface that's not very smooth, that has a little bit of roughness to it? Well, we just put a, a little ball off on its own with a couple of little um, springs to create these cool little triangles. Right, that are popping off of the edge. That models are, 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 are pointy bits. Right? Now, first thing to think about is only a small number of the surface atoms are actually going to interact with each other because of the roughness, the microscopic roughness of the surfaces. And so they interact and they, they hit each other and they cause this little bit of compression and we get that force, that response that happens. And that, in a sense, explains what's going on with their, uh, why we get this, this perpendicular for contact force, what we've called the normal force. But let's think about it a little bit farther. What happens if we take that block and we drag it across the table? If we drag it across the table, the surfaces move relative to each other. 
So that surface force has now has not just a perpendicular component, but it also has to have a parallel component as well. Just imagine these two surfaces going by each other and then those little triangular bits bang into each other, right? You're gonna see, you can see how you're gonna get a little bit of force pointing in the, op, you know, in the parallel direction. Let's go even deeper. So what actually keeps these, what is actually the interaction that's happening between the two surfaces? So we've zoomed in now on these two surfaces. Right? Now, once again, only a small number of these surface atoms are actually interacting, right? much less than the actual number of atoms that are on the surface due to the roughness. The darker shaded springs are actually modeling chemical bonds. So that would be actual bonds between atoms that make the solid, the solid that it is. And they could be ionic bonds, or they could be covalent bonds, or they could be metallic bonds. Right? But they represent chemical bonds. Right. Now, the slightly shaded, ghosty-looking spring right, that you see here are called inter are modeling intermolecular forces, which we're going to shorten as IFs because uh, we don't like writing intermolecular forces over and over again. Now, those are slightly different, and they're weaker. They're weaker interactions, but also they have a spring-like character to them. Now, if you remember your chemistry, you'll have heard the word intermolecular forces before. Right? And again, we're going we're gonna to go a little deeper in modeling what an intermolecular force happens to be because it's kind of important because right now we're starting to, starting to get a picture about maybe why we're not going to be able to walk through that wall because that atom, as it gets close to the other atom on the other surface, uh, it, it encounters this little bitty spring and called an intermolecular force that keeps it from crashing into the other atom or going past the other atom. And in some ways too, you can imagine we'd have to break a whole bunch of chemical bonds in order to actually get through the wall. And at that point, you're not walking through the wall, you're smashing through the wall like the Kool-Aid man. So this is a neat model. And I want you to think about why this is a cool model because it allows us to predict things. It allows us to answer questions that maybe we didn't quite understand before. And one of those is how does glue work? So Simple questions like why can't we walk through walls and how does glue work, right? Actually takes a pretty sophisticated model about surfaces. And when we use this Einstein model, we can start really getting a better understanding about maybe something like how glue works. So for example, look at these two surfaces. I told you that uh, only a small number of surface atoms are actually interacting with each other through these intermolecular forces, right? Uh, because of the surface roughness. But just imagine if we could fill that space with something, if we could fill that space with something that would uh, have this intermolecular attraction with, and, and that flows, right? And it would have this intermolecular attraction with all of the uh, surface atoms, all of them, not just some of them, and then all of the surface atoms on the other object, right? Then you would get all of these really cool intermolecular forces and add it up over the entire surface, you get something that is absolutely stuck and you'd have to pull really hard to break all of those intermolecular forces. And that's exactly how some glues work. Other glues actually work by literally causing chemical bonds to happen. Those would be stronger glues because the chemical bonds are stronger than the intermolecular forces. So when you're spreading glue on something, what you're actually doing is filling all of those little bumpy regions on the material like the wood and on both surfaces and you squish them together and that causes these, uh, an increase in these intermolecular forces, right? So that's how some of these glues, glues actually work. Now let's, uh, let's talk about moving the objects relative to each other. So ah, there's no glue, we got rid of the glue. That does make, actually, I'm gonna go back for a second because it makes me want you, I want you to think about something that you can do right now. If you take your cell phone, because everybody in the, on the planet right now has a cell phone, you probably have one in front of you. If you take your finger and you place your finger on the surface of your cell phone and then gently pull it up a little bit, you can almost feel it kind of sticks just a little bit. Not quite a lot, but just enough to be like, well, yeah, it feels like maybe there's a little bit of stickiness there. Right? You also know if you take two smooth surfaces, relatively smooth surfaces, and you put them uh, on each other, uh, they don't really stick together. But if you take relatively smooth surfaces, get them a little bit wet and stick them together, what you're doing is you're filling in those microscopic little voids there, and that increases the stickiness. So adding just a, even a little water can behave like a glue. 
Okay, now back to relative motions of things as they slide past each other, All right? So as these things slide past each other, first off, what do you gotta do? Well, you gotta break intermolecular forces, right? So they're, they're, they're attractive and repulsive. And so if I'm pulling the one atom away from uh, the other atom, right? It's got a force that's connecting them, that's gotta be broken, right? And then you're gonna run into something else. Right? That atom, that little pointy atom on the top is going to bump into the other pointy atom via another intermolecular force. Right? And so you can see that that's what's causing this change in the direction of the contact force. It also helps us think about static friction and kinetic friction and the differences between static friction and kinetic friction. So you might have learned about static friction and kinetic friction and that there are they're sort of two different things and you use these two different coefficients when it's sitting still and when it's moving. And maybe you've gotten a bit of a, a hand-waving argument about why that might be the case. But with this just simple ball and spring model of uh, solids, we can start to kind of understand why that static friction might is typically larger than the kinetic friction. It's usually harder to get something to start moving than it is to keep it moving due to friction. All right, so once again, let's think about that, that surface force. So we've got it modeled here as the force by the table on the block, right? That's the subscripts there, by the table T on the block B. Really, that surface force is just made up of two components. It has a perpendicular component that we call the normal. That's N. It's often called normal force or something like that. Uh, we just call it the normal. And the reason we call it the normal is because it's not a force in and of itself, it's the component of a surface force. And then we have a parallel component called friction, right? So the frictional force is just a surface force. It's this interaction and it's a component of this surface force, right? Because there's also the perpendicular component as well that's produced by uh, moving these things across each other. Now let's go back to our model and think about that static and kinetic friction. Well, with static friction, I had all of these little um, little bitty bits that were attached to, to the other little bitty bits on the other surface that were creating uh, these intermolecular forces. And all of those intermolecular forces had to be broken first in order to get the whole block to start sliding. I had to break all of those intermolecular forces to get the thing to start sliding. And then once it starts sliding, well, now it's moving. And so it can't form inter these uh, forces as strongly or as quickly as it already had established. So we can start coming up with models and explanations about why static friction might be, uh, might be higher than the kinetic friction, why it might be harder to get something started. Now let's get down to the, to the question, the big question that we've all came here to find out. What causes these tiny spring-like forces between the atoms of two objects in contact? That's the intermolecular forces we're talking about, right? So we, we, we've said, okay, well, I wanna run into a wall and I wanna run through it. But as I get closer, if I put my hand up to the wall, my hand gets closer and closer to the wall and then it touches, or at least it seems like it touches, it feels like it touches to me. And I can press in a little bit and my hand compresses, but at a certain point, I'm either gonna have to break the wall, actually break pieces of the wall, uh, or I'm just gonna stop. And what is that contact force between us that keeps, makes, keeps me from going through the wall? And we've so shown, we've been modeling it as little springs, uh, we've been calling intermolecular forces. So where does this come from? Well, it comes from the electric force and the electric charges, and partly the electric charges that are made in our hands and our feet in the objects that are all around us, right? And we can, we can kind of get an experience of, where the, of these electric charges quite easily, right? And there's a couple of different types of electric charge and we're gonna find that out, right? You can do this experiment at home. You probably don't have the tape there in front of you right now to do this, but I'm gonna talk you through it and you're gonna go to the video later, you're gonna watch it and you're gonna actually try this with a couple of pieces of tape. So what I want you to do is I want you to place two strips of tape on a smooth table. A little bit of the tape is gonna overhang the end so you can easily pull it off at the, after we're done here. But you're gonna place two pieces of tape smoothly on the table and you're gonna label them with a, a little letter B, a little letter B at the top. Now you're gonna place two more strips labeled T on the top of those strips. You're gonna offset them a little bit so that way, uh, again, it's easy for you to pull them off. 
Now you're going to remove the two sets of tape strips from the table and then separate them into individual little marked T and B strips. The T stands for top, the B stands for bottom. So top tape, bottom tape, right? Makes some sense. So right there, you've created a really cool little system to investigate electric charges. The strips, T and B, have opposite charges, right? And so when we have opposite charges, you can put these little pieces of tape on toothpicks, you can move them close to each other, and as you get close, what you'll notice is the tapes will be attracted to each other. And then the other thing you can do is you can take a couple of T tapes where they are the same charge, put them on a couple of toothpicks, move them close to each other, and you will see that they repel each other. This is an attractive and repulsive uh, force called the electric force, right? That is, comes about uh, and is experienced between objects that are charged, all right? Now, what do we mean by charge? What is charge? Well, once again, we're going to go down to the atom. We're getting back down to the idea of what an atom is and what it's composed of. Now, this is a, a, the Bohr model of the atom. It's a classical model of the atom. We're going to have to talk about a quantum model of the atom here in a moment. But right now, let's just start with what we call the Bohr model of the atom. That's a nucleus with electrons whizzing around that nucleus. The, negative, the, the electrons are negatively charged, and they whiz around a positively charged nucleus. Right? And um, yeah, there's a lot of electrons in one coulomb of charge. A coulomb is the unit that we use to measure charge, and there's six times 10 to the 18. So that's six plus 18 zeros right, of electrons in one coulomb of charge. Now we say that the electrons are negatively charged and the protons are positively charged. We could, just, could have just as easily said that the electrons are banana charged and the protons are apple charged. And that when you take a banana and bring it next to a banana, it's gonna repel. And when you take an apple and you take a banana and you bring them together, they're going to attract. We just have arbitrarily decided to go with the names positive and negative. When I say we, I mean scientists that are long dead. I didn't get to make that choice. Right. If we go down even further, let's look into the proton and into the neutron. Protons and neutrons are made up of really cool particles called quarks. And quarks have what we call fractional charge. There's up quarks and then there's down quarks. Up quarks have a positive two thirds the charge of an electron and a down quark has a negative one third the charge of an electron. And you can see how if you pair these things up in certain ways, you get something that has a positive charge, the proton, that's two up quarks and one down quark. And then neutrons are composed of two down quarks and one up quark. And so what that means is the neutron ends up with a total net charge of nothing, and the proton has a net charge the same as the electron, only positive. So that's our two types of charges. So when we're charging things like the tape, what we're really doing is ripping electrons off of the tape. One tape grabs electrons, uh-oh. I have to go back to my screen there. There it is. Nothing like updates in the middle of a webinar. Thank you, Apple. All right. So uh, we were talking about those two tapes and ripping electrons off of those two tapes. So we were ripping electrons off of the tapes. One tape will get electrons. The other tape will lose electrons. So if it's losing electrons, that means it's going to have more protons left over uh, than it had before. So, or it's gonna have more, it's gonna have the same number of protons, but it's going to have less electrons. So that's going to make the one tape positively charged. And now the other tape that has more electrons than it had before is going to be negatively charged. So what are we doing when we're charging things? We're adding and we're pulling away, um, adding and pulling away electrons. And we can express uh, the magnitude of the force between charges using uh, a mathematical representation we call Coulomb's law, basically showing that the paired vectors uh, are going to represent your interaction between your two charged objects. And if we have uh, like charges, those vectors are going to point away from each other, right? That symbolizes the repulsion that's happening. And if we have uh, opposite charges, then those vectors are going to point towards each other. And that's going to symbolize the attractive component. Right? And then the magnitude is going to be determined by the size of the charges and the distance between them. The distance is key. I want you to pay attention to the R that's in the bottom of the equation there. It's R squared. 
So the distance is really important. So things are attracted to each other. There's either attraction or there's repulsion based on the type of the charges based off of the distance. So the closer things are, the larger the force. The farther away they are, the smaller the electric force. And that's the key thing that's gonna start getting in our brain to start understanding why as we get closer to things, what's going on. Right? We're not quite there yet, right? We're not quite there, but we're going to start to build this model and start to understand it. Now, before we can do that, I want to talk about redistributing charge, because the way that charge can redistribute, say, as an example, on these uh, these apples, these apple juice cans, um, not soda. We do not uh, promote the consumption of sugary beverages. This is apple juice, which is also very sugary. So never mind on that. Uh, we'll call it kale juice. This is kale juice cans, right? Uh, we're gonna redistribute the charge on our kale juice cans. Uh, and it's gonna become important because really what's gonna happen, those intermolecular forces, that, that stuff that we've been talking about that keeps us from moving through walls, it's gonna have to do with some charge redistribution. So let's think about how that might work. If I take two kale juice cans, they're metal cans, so electrons can move easily through them. I set them up on insulating supports like plastic cups, and I set them next to each other such that they're touching, and then I bring a negatively charged balloon. Say I take a balloon and I rub it on my sweater, and then I bring it close by. Well, as I get closer, all of those electric charges, those negative electrons, are going to experience a repulsive force, and they're going to try to move away from the negatively charged balloon. Now, the protons can't move. They're stuck within the metal. They're localized. They cannot move. But what happens is the electrons will, and they'll move from one end of the soda cans to the other end, getting as far away as possible from that negatively charged balloon. Now, if I separate out the cans, I remove the balloons, right? All of a sudden, uh, I have two cans that are oppositely charged. So I was able to redistribute the charge without touching anything, which is pretty interesting. We can see this again with a, uh, another balloon. So maybe we can't, um, maybe we can't quite walk through walls, but we can stick stuff to walls. That same balloon, let's say we rub it on our on our sweater and we take it up to a wall and we put it on a wall and it stays there. Works very well in winter because it's much drier in winter. But give this a shot, you probably have sometime in your life. Rub your balloon on your sweater and stick it to a wall and it stays stuck. Now why might this happen? So again, we'd have a negatively charged balloon. Now if you keep in mind, what does that mean? Well, first off, there's positive charges in the balloon and negative charges. It just means that we have a local region of net negative charge. So there's more little negatives on the surface of the balloon right in this region than there happens to be positives. And that's the spot where I rubbed it on my sweater. Now, as I bring it close to the wall, you notice the wall is just neutrally charged and balanced and there's no net region of charge. As I bring it closer though, right, we can redistribute the charge locally. The little negative charges can move a little this way, right? The positive charges don't really move much at all, but the little negative charges can move a little bit, just a little bit, because these things again are fixed inside of atoms at the surface, but it doesn't take much. It doesn't take much to get the, a pretty decently sized force. So a region of net positive charge is formed on the surface of the wall. Now the surface, the whole wall is still neutral, but you get a small region of net positive charge formed on the surface. The electrons near the surface of the wall move away from the balloon, right? They can't go far, they're bound to their atoms, but they're moving a little bit away. We're just redistributing them a little bit so that now the protons are a little bit closer, right? The negatively charged balloon is now attracted to that positive charge near the surface. And it's repelled by the negative charges farther away, but the attractive force wins because the positive charges are closer, right? So you can see what might happen as I bring this close by. This is, uh, you know, we're, we're inducing a charge in the wall, that's the word we use, and then that causes the balloon to stick. Because the positive charge is closer than the negative charge that had to move away, the balloon stuck to our surface. And we can see that macroscopically, you can do that. Well, let's go deeper. Let's go down to the atomic level. Right? And we get to what we call van der Waals attractions. Those intermolecular forces that we've been talking about are really manifestations of what we call van der Waals forces. 
Two atoms will experience a net attractive force when they get close together, just as the balloon is attracted to the wall. So if I take these two atoms and they're really far apart, they don't experience a net force. They have electrons whizzing around them and those electrons want to be as far away from each other as absolutely possible. So they sort of distribute, we can say in this kind of like shell here. So they're distributed around in a circle and you've got a nice little ball of uh, electrons. Probably a little more complicated than that if we think of a, of a quantum model, but this is a, a nice mental model to think about how these would be distributed. Now, as I bring those atoms closer together, what do we notice? Right? Well, the electrons in the one atom want to get farther away from the electrons in the other atom. What's happening is these electrons are constantly moving. The electrons are constantly moving around, and when you get a little bit of imbalance between one side, you know, the charge on one side versus the other side, and you have them real, these atoms really close together, then the electrons can be kind of pushed over to one side to the right on one atom, right? And that causes the electrons on the other atom to move to the right because they want to get really close to that proton, right? When we redistribute the charges, the electrons from one atom get pushed away to the, to, towards one side, and then now the kind of exposes this positive core uh, underneath, and those electrons on the other atom want to get close. They want to get, they're attracted to that to that nucleus. And because the nucleus, the positively charged nucleus now is closer, right, it's going to experience a larger attractive force. So that's the attraction that's happening. That's the attractive component of that intermolecular forces we were talking about. Those little springs that we were saying cause things to stick, right, to the, to the surfaces, the surfaces to stick to each other. But there's also going to be a repulsive component. We have to understand that as well. Right? So what happens is we keep bringing these things closer and closer and closer. Well, let's go way out. So first off, this is a, a, a plot of a model for the uh, van der Waal forces. What we're looking at is force as a function of the distance the two atoms are away from each other. Right? If we start off way far in the distance and the atoms are really far away from each other, and they're neutral atoms, right? they have the same number of positive charges as they have negative charges, so they're neutral overall those neutral atoms experience no electric forces at long distances. Now, as we bring them closer together, right, uh, an example from chemistry would be what we call dispersion forces. Those dispersion forces happen, like I said, when you get a little bit of an imbalance and you have another atom that's close by and you get this, um, this sort of distribution that you see here in the middle. And that causes this attraction as the atoms get close to each other, the, the, we get an induced electric force that causes an attraction between the two atoms. However, if we keep going and we keep going and we keep going, eventually we find that the force becomes not attractive, it becomes repulsive. This is the repulsive component right here. All right, so we have this attractive bit, and then we have this repulsive bit, right? And then right when the force is zero, we call that our contact distance. That's when we say that the atoms are in contact, although nothing's really touching anything, which is interesting because these are all non-contact forces, the electric force. So what exactly is it then that's keeping these things, that's causing the, rep the repulsion? Well, it turns out that we can't just think about our electrons as little bitty balls whizzing around uh, a central nucleus, we have to take a more quantum E approach, that the electrons actually form these, these kind of shells, these clouds of electrons whizzing around. And we've modeled that here by making these sorts of bluish looking blob uh, structures. That represents the electron cloud. And there's a rule that says, it's called the Pauli exclusion principle, that says that those electron clouds do not overlap. Now they can, but we call that chemical bonding. When those clouds overlap, we get a chemical bond, right? And we can make chemical bonds, but in our case, you don't want to chemically bond to the wall. That would be very bad, right? We want to try to walk through it, but we can't. And the reason we can't is because unless we're chemically bonding, those electron clouds cannot overlap. So they can redistribute. So the electrons redistribute the cloud redistributes, and that's what causes the attractive bit, 
but as those little uh, these little shaded regions here get closer and closer, they bump up against each other and you get a massive and very large repulsive force that happens due to this exclusion principle because the electron clouds are you know, not allowed to overlap. And that's this bit that we see here. You see how fast that gets repulsive? And that's actually what we're feeling when we're running into the wall. So let's take our little model. We're gonna have some fun. We were talking about tape earlier. We can use this model, start again, thinking about macroscopic things, right? Uh, I like the little spring model for all of this stuff. Let's pull that, ta that tape off the surface. Let's think about what happens when we pull the tape that we just uh, pulled off just a minute ago, right? We, again, we can think about all these little van der Waal interactions, these little intermolecular forces that are happening between the, the sticky residue, right? On the, the tape surface and then all of the little uh, nooks and crannies of the actual surface that it's sitting on. And as you pull this thing up, you're stretching those intermolecular bonds. You're yanking on the attractive bits until eventually something happens. Uh, you break those, those uh, forces. We gotta be careful. We call them intermolecular bonds, but they're not actually, we don't call them I mean, intermolecular forces. We break those little forces and those break and that's where we get the separation of the tape from the table. Here's another macroscopic model that can help you and, and your students think about attractive and repulsive pieces from the electric force. Let's go back to the idea, the thinking of taking that balloon. We've got that balloon and we're gonna rub it on our sweater and then we're gonna stick it, not now instead of sticking it to the wall, let's stick it to the ceiling. Think about getting your students to model this. What happens is if you, if you bring that balloon close to the ceiling, but not touching, and then you let go of that balloon, well, first, since the, that balloon's gonna accelerate to the ceiling and you can actually have them do this. On a nice dry day, they rub the balloon on some cloth or something, they get it nice and charged, they put it near uh, a ceiling and uh, don't let it, you know, just, just really close but without touching and then let it go and it's going to be attracted to the ceiling. Well, so what does that mean? Well, it's accelerating up towards the ceiling. And so we can model the forces that are behaving with a free body diagram. We've got the gravitational force on the balloon pointing down, and we've got the electric force on the balloon pointing up. Those are the only two forces. Nothing's in contact. There's no, non -con there's no contact force yet. So it's gonna accelerate. It's gonna accelerate as it goes up, right? It's because it, it, it's moving up. That means that the electric force has to be bigger than the gravitational force. And as it gets closer, the electric force is going to get larger because that's ultimately what our, um, our Coulomb's law model says. So the acceleration is gonna get larger until eventually it hits the ceiling and at some point stops. So that means there has to be some other contact. So there has to be some other force that's involved here, right? It's difficult to explain just by the electric force. There's some other force that's causing the repulsion in order to keep this system like we see. So we need both an electric force that's attractive as well as some sort of, of repulsive contact force that we are now just calling uh, Pauli, basically based off of Pauli's exclusion principle. It's a little more complicated than that in reality with lots of fancy math, right? But ultimately that's what's going on. So why can't we walk through walls? We can answer that question. Uh, and it comes down to quantum physics, comes down to the bonds between atoms. But if we model our solids as these cool little balls with springs, right, we can get a nice little picture in our mind that explains quite a lot of very interesting physics. And that is all of my time and all I wanted to chat with you guys today about, right? Uh, just to point out, a lot of this comes from our curriculum experience physics. In fact, it crosses over a couple of different investigations. One investigation having to do with force and types of forces, where we use the Einstein model of the solid to understand friction, right, to understand um, tension, right, and other types of contact forces, right. And then the other one is investigation four, which is the electric force, the uh, electric force being uh, the the induction that we see that creates the the attraction for the van der Waals forces, and then we discuss some of again some of these quantum effects. So the Curriculum is called Experience Physics. And again, I've been Christopher Moore. It's been great having a chance to chat with you. And Julie will now come in and ask any questions that you might have been thinking about as we were going along.
<laughs> thank you, Chris. That was great. Um, we actually have a few comments that are thanking you. Um, one is to let you know that he loved your explanations and is going to stop trying to walk through walls to test contact forces. <laughs> no, no, no. It's a great exercise um, to, to really, you know, for students, you really need to take the, the abstract and you need to make it as concrete as possible. And I learned that when I was learning how to, how to teach physics um, long, long time ago teaching high school. And, you know, that was the big thing. You want to take the abstract and try to make it as concrete as possible. So I just interpreted that as taking students and having them run into concrete walls. <laughs> Um, for those of you in the audience, if you have any questions or comments, please feel free to type them in the questions box, and I would be happy to read them out loud for you. Uh, remember, your lines are muted. Give you a couple seconds to type that in. Um, Chris, I just wanted to thank you for joining us today. This was really fun. And I like your alternative bison photo, how it matches up there. <laughs> the other angle. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, I can actually take pictures of the of this this one. <laughs> okay, what's well, an what, Omaha number? Oh, um, the first question we have here is what would you normally show or teach next after this? Well, that depends. So this is actually the investigative phenomena that goes across um, a couple of different things. So uh, following you know, electric force, the electric force, of course, is broken up into a couple of different um, learning experiences. So after we would deal with the electric force itself, then we'd be looking at electric fields, right? And uh, following that, we would uh, go into, um, you know, current as an example, looking at how the electric force and fields manifest within wires. And, and that's the basic process. So in our curriculum, we actually look at forces and non-contact forces as an entire storyline. So we start off with looking at motion and forces uh, as a storyline itself. So that would be a lot of your kinematics and a, um, and a lot of, and, and a model again for, for, for forces, right? That creates one storyline, how things move and why they do. And then the second storyline is on non-contact forces. And so we go right into gravitation, then electric force, then magnetic force, right? Then, um, uh, oh, what am I missing? That's, oh, I'm not missing it. And then um, forces in materials. So we look again, we would look at forces in, inside of materials. So that makes up an entire storyline just on the non-contact forces and then the forces that we're talking about here, specifically like intermolecular forces inside materials. So what you actually saw today was a, a bit of an overview of a, of a couple of different investigations, pieces from a couple of different investigations, where we can keep going back to the same uh, anchoring phenomena, investigative phenomena, uh, over and over again. So we keep re revisiting the same phenomena as we go throughout um, different types of material. The idea, of course, being that we're trying to connect all these ideas together, that science isn't a, a, a mix of lots of little stuffs, right? Like the electric force is something that I talk about at this time, and it has no bearing on the contact force and the normal force that I'm dealing with over here when blocks are sliding on inclines or whatever it might be, right? And that, that they are part of the same universe and they should be learned in that, in that way. And that's the big idea. All right, the next question is, do you always use a visual like the bison? Yes. That's an easy one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, you know, with our uh, with our investigative phenomena, right, there's always some sort of visual because it is a phenomena. It's a phenomena that we uh, are, are trying to show graphically. Um, you know, in the curriculum, we'll use videos, too. So in the digital aspect, there are going to be some videos uh, because some, to some of the phenomena, it's very, very difficult to put in a on a static 2D page when you're actually looking at these. Sometimes it's phenomena that you can actually look at in the classroom, like you can literally make it happen, right? Those are some of the best ones. Um, and this was just a cute picture for me to get a little bit of Omaha, Nebraska on the page. I live in Omaha for those that are wondering. <laughs> we'll find something in Rhode Island for you, Julie. I, there's nothing interesting in Rhode Island. <laughs> Just kidding. If anybody in the audience is from there, I'm born and raised. <laughs> um, excellent. Well, 
Chris, thank you so much for your time today. And those of you in the audience, we appreciate you joining us. And if we can ever help you with anything, just let us know. All right. Thank you, everybody. I appreciate it. Thank you.